Hi, I'm Arnie Gunderson with Fairwinds Energy Education. The CO2 smokescreen, Building New Nukes Will Make Global Warming Worse, is the title of a groundbreaking speech I gave recently at Canada's University of Quebec at Montreal. Serious research and accurate data analysis led the entire Fairwinds crew to the startling conclusion that new nukes are too costly and take so long to build that it will be impossible for them to even begin to help to eliminate the problem of global climate change. Actually, the evidence we reviewed proved that new nukes will actually make climate change worse. My presentation at the University of Quebec was filmed by an award-winning Montreal documentary cinematographer, Martin Duckworth. We at Fairwinds personally thank Mr. Duckworth for donating his time to film my presentation so that it could be shared far and wide. I'm asking you to do two things. First, after you watch this video, please post it via social media for your friends, family, and colleagues. It's important information that we must dispense worldwide. Second, please make a financial donation to Fairwinds Energy Education so as we move into 2017, we can continue programs like this one. Five student interns joined the Fairwinds crew in analyzing reams of data with two PhDs who donate their time as science advisors to Fairwinds. One is a double Fulbright and the other is a leading ecological economist. We believe this year-long effort was well worth it and we need your help to continue this type of cutting-edge work. I hope you feel moved to action by this presentation and the rest of the nuclear CO2 smokescreen information we'll be sharing with you. Thank you for supporting Fairwinds Energy Education. We'll keep you informed. Bonjour, thank you for coming. Um, I'd like to thank the, the people of Montreal and the, the province of Quebec for holding this, uh, this important conference. Um, what you're about to see is a presentation that's taken Fairwinds almost a year uh, to develop. We've had four University of Vermont uh, um, students that, that uh, helped with the analysis as well as two, uh, two doctors. One is a double Fulbright and the other is a, uh, uh, the head of the environmental ecological movement. So the numbers I'm going to give you today are, uh, have been totally fact-checked and are impeccable. The, uh, the topic today is the CO2 smoke screen. I was in the nuclear industry and built nuclear power plants in the 70s and the 80s. And uh, I can assure you that those plants were, were built, when those plants were built, they had absolutely nothing to do with carbon dioxide and, and, and global warming. Um, when we built them, and I was part of the we that built them, we uh, were worried about energy shortage. You may, may remember you know, gas line uh, shortages and things like that. Um, uh, they were built with the mistaken impression that building nukes would uh, eliminate the energy shortage. Uh, but it had nothing to do with carbon dioxide. So now the new focus on nuclear is, oh my gosh, without them, we're going to destroy the world and it's all going to melt. Um, and my position is that that is a smokescreen. The, the bottom line here is that um, um, 35 years in the future, that uh, these nuclear plants that are proposed are only going to mitigate carbon dioxide by about 6%. And what I'd like you to do today is um, uh, I, I'm going to ignore, for the purpose of this presentation, the desecration of, of, of native lands from mining the desecration of, of, of uh, Fukushima Prefecture and other uh, areas that might be destroyed from uh, nuclear disasters. And also, of course, the long-term storage for um, a million years of the, uh, of the nuclear waste. So let's just set all of those liabilities aside and, and talk about money. Right now, there's 438 nuclear power plants in the world. The, um, 
Um, and that's a nuclear industry number uh, from the World Nuclear Association. But I think it's important to remember that all of those plants were built in the late 60s, the 70s, and the 80s, with a few built since then. But the, the uh, big building uh, process was in the 70s and 80s. And um, in the, at the very end of that, uh, I think what Forbes magazine had to say about this nuclear buildup is important. Now, Forbes, if you're not familiar with it, is, is certainly not an anti-nuclear group. They're a managerial uh, uh, Bible uh, throughout the world. And they called this nuclear buildup the biggest managerial disaster in the history of the world. So now we've got these 438 plants. And the nuclear industry is, is saying, you know, don't shut them down because the ice caps are going to melt without them. And what I'd like to do for the first half of this presentation is focus on the, um, uh, the impact that the nukes that are running right now are having on the, uh, on the environment. So there's, there's two numbers I'll be talking about. The first is gigatons, and, and that's how many, a giga is a thousand million. Uh, you might call it a billion in the U.S., but other cultures don't use it. So a thousand million is a giga. So a gigaton is a thousand million tons. And um, so that's the amount of junk that's thrown into the atmosphere every year. And the, the second term is, uh, is PPM, which is parts per million. So once you throw this carbon dioxide in the air, it gets dispersed. And how many parts per million? So we'll be talking about gigatons and parts per million throughout this. One's a concentration and one is just the total number of pounds that go up into the atmosphere. So the, uh, the first thing uh, to, to know is that uh, some really bright people dating back until the 60s decided it would be a really good idea to constantly measure the carbon dioxide buildup in the, uh, in the atmosphere. And they did this in Hawaii at a place called Mauna Loa. So when you hear about the Mauna Loa data, um, it's the oldest continuous sampling of carbon dioxide uh, in history, and it dates back until uh, the 1960s. So this slide shows that back in 1960, carbon dioxide was at um, around 310, and now it's over 400. You notice the sawtooth nature of the, of the curve? It got bumps going up and down. In the, uh, in the summer, plants suck carbon dioxide out, so the curve drops down a little bit. And then in the winter, um, carbon dioxide goes back up. So what you're seeing is seasonal, summer going down, winter going up. But the general trend is up. The second piece, and this is much harder to get a hold of. That, the first one was called Mauna Loa data. Uh, the second one is uh, how many tons of carbon dioxide yeah, are human beings throwing up into the atmosphere every year. And we looked at, uh, we've gotten about nine sources for this data. So you'll see the, the little error bars on the, on the data. But um, as of last year, human beings were throwing up 35.8 gigatons, or 35,000 million tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. That's a lot. But what's, what's equally important is if those 438 nuclear plants had never been built and in, in their place had been built gas plants, natural gas plants, what would happen to carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere today? So <clears throat> this is Mauna Loa and parts per million put in side by side. The parts per million are growing at about two parts per million per year. And the, um, the human beings are throwing up about an extra 730 million tons a year, about 0.7 gigatons every year. It's going up and up and up uh, of carbon dioxide into the, into the atmosphere. OK, so right now, this is the last year. This is how much carbon dioxide you and me and everybody else on the planet is throwing up into the atmosphere. And that's that 36 gigatons, 36,000 million tons of carbon dioxide. That's what we're throwing up as, a, as the world right now. So, and here's a question. This is audience participation at this point. 
Now, if those 438 nuclear plants had never been built, how much more carbon dioxide would go up into the air? And I'll, I'll, this is all, I'll ask you to raise your hand. I'm gonna, the choices are 5% uh, more, 10% more, 20% more, or 50% more carbon dioxide. Okay, so how many people think that if those 438 nukes had never been built, we have um, uh, carbon dioxide would go up by 5%? Couple? How about by 10%? Couple? How about a 20% change in carbon dioxide? And a 50% change in carbon dioxide? In actuality, all 438 plants, if they had been natural gas instead of nuclear, would only increase the amount of carbon dioxide thrown up into the atmosphere by 3.3%. I just, I think that's a profound number to focus on. 438 plants that the nuclear industry will tell you are critically needed. And if we shut them down, we're gonna have a melt, we're gonna melt the, the, the Arctic ice. Uh, are only contributing 3%. Now to put that in another perspective, let's think about that Mauna Loa data at 400 ppm. If all those nukes had never been built, and in their place we did natural gas, and I'm not suggesting natural gas is a good thing, but in their place we did natural gas, ppms would only increase by one. One part per million for all of those nuclear plants. So now we can talk about the, the, uh, the desecration of, of native lands. We can talk about the, um, the desecration of Fukushima Prefecture, the likelihood of a meltdown in the future, which most scientists put at about 50% in the next 20 years for a Chernobyl-like meltdown. Um, and of course, the storage of nuclear waste for a million years. And against that 3% reduction in carbon dioxide, we're facing all those other risks. The last slide in this series is this one. So there's 438 plants. If you take 3% and divide by 438, that's the contribution that each plant provides to reduction in global warming. So each power plant reduces the amount of carbon dioxide in the, in the atmosphere by seven one thousandths of one percent. So when you hear in the states, of course, we're talking about closing a power plant in, um, in Illinois or closing power plants in New York State and how critical that is for a, um, um, to, to mitigate global warming. It's just not true. If all of them were shut down, it'd only be a 3% improvement and any individual plant is only seven one, one thousandths of one percent. Literally smaller than a drop of, in the bucket. So when you hear about nuclear power taking a bite out of global warming, it's more of taking a nibble out of global warming. All right, so let's now look at 2050. So 35 years from now, the nuclear industry would like to have a thousand new nuclear plants. Um, which is really 500 new plants plus the 450 that are out there are going to be uh, dismantled, decommissioned. So we're left with um, a, a new build of 1,000 nuclear power plants. It's what the nuclear industry has said the world needs to uh, mitigate global warming. The, um, and that comes from the Director General of the World Nuclear Association. Now, if you look at an, another famous person is James Hansen. Anybody heard of him? He's the NASA guy who's been big on CO2. And, and he's absolutely right on the damage that CO2 does. But he's absolutely wrong on the fact that, that nuclear can mitigate it. Now, Hansen says we need 2,500 nukes in the next 35 years. If we build 1,000 nukes in the next 35 years, that's the equivalent of more than one a week. What's that going to cost? If, um, let's go ahead, 35 years now. And right now we're at 36 gigatons of junk being thrown in the atmosphere. You've heard of COP21, which is the Paris Accords of last, uh, last December, where the nations of the world 
committed to uh, reducing carbon dioxide? Well, MIT has done a study that shows that even if everybody is committed to reducing their carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide, the, the amount of carbon dioxide we throw up into the atmosphere is going to increase to about 64 gigatons per year. This is an MIT number. And th this is the, the university that has a Tokyo electric chair as part of its nuclear faculty. So certainly um, not produced by, by anti-nukes. So if, if Paris is implemented successfully, we're still going to almost double the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Why is that? That's because you know, countries like India and China and, uh, and, and Southeast Asia and Africa all want to live like we do. And how can we drive around in our cars and keep the air conditioning on and not expect others to live that way too? So MIT's position is even if COP21 is implemented, the best case, they have worse cases, but the best case is that the amount of carbon dioxide thrown up into the atmosphere is, um, is 64 gigatons, an enormous number. So you could see we're in trouble. So the nuclear industry's position is that we need to knock that number down um, by building 1,000 new nuclear plants. And here's what would happen if we built 1,000 new nuclear plants. We would decrease carbon dioxide by 6%. That's it. 1,000 new nukes would decrease the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere by 6%. On the, on the left of these slides, you'll see a bunch of numbers, the calculations. All of these are nuclear numbers. This comes from the World Nuclear Association. These aren't numbers that, uh, uh, that we dreamed up. So we're looking at a 6% reduction in carbon dioxide if we build 1,000 new nuclear power plants. What's that going to cost? Eight trillion dollars to make a 6% reduction. Now where does that eight trillion come from? It comes from Lazard. Lazard is an investment banker. They don't have a dog in this fight. They're just following the money. So is it really worth, the question I put to you is, is it really worth eight trillion dollars to reduce carbon in the atmosphere 35 years out by 6%? There's a second piece to that. It will take 35 years to build those nuclear plants. And carbon dioxide is growing at 2%, 2 ppm per year. So that means the average nuclear plant's gonna come online 17 years from now, which means that carbon dioxide's gonna grow two times 17 or 34 parts per million while we're waiting for those nuclear power plants to be built. Carbon dioxide is not going to take a vacation while we sit around and wait 35 years for a 6% solution. That power plant, by the way, is in California. So if it's gone up 35 parts per million while we're waiting for these plants to be built, now those power plants not only have to reduce the carbon that we're living with now, but they've got to bend the curve and make it lower than what it was now, which can't happen. Those six, uh, that 6% six of the nukes will never produce enough uh, carbon dioxide offsets to offset this 34 parts per million um, that they're already setting, uh, or already occurring at a, at a deficit. This next series of, of 10 slides comes from Rocky Mountain Institute, and I'd like to thank them for, uh, for giving me permission to use it. Uh, what this does on the left is what would happen if you built three gigawatts of nuclear power, and on the right, what would happen if you, uh, if you used uh, photovoltaics instead. Um, a gigawatt is roughly the size of a single power plant. So, what would, uh, so three gigawatts, which is where we'll get to at the end of this slide, is the equivalent of building three nuclear power plants. And I might add, these numbers are very optimistic in favor of the, of the nuclear industry. So in year one, you, um, you start to um, license a nuclear power plant. That's represented by the paperwork on the left. And um, on the right is you build a plant to create solar cells. So left is building these three nukes. Right is building photovoltaics. So year one, 
nothing. And the key is to look at the very top of this line up here. It's how many gigawatts are generated by photovoltaics versus how many gigawatts are generated by nuclear power. So year one, no gigawatts are produced. Year two, the power, the, the, the facility to build solar cells has already built enough solar cells to generate one gigawatt. Remember, that's one gigawatt is the equivalent of one nuclear power plant. So in the first year, while the nuclear plant is still being licensed, you've got the equivalent amount of, of photovoltaics already out there and being implemented. Second year, now you've got three gigawatts. That's this number up in the, up in the right hand corner. Three gigawatts of photovoltaics out on the grid and still the nuclear power plant is still just tying on its sneakers. Year three, six gigawatts to zero for the nuclear. In the fifth year, 10 gigawatts, nothing for the nuclear. It's still being built. This is now they put a shovel in the ground or actually uh, uh, building the power plant. Year six, 15 gigawatts, nothing for the nuclear. Year seven, 21 gigawatts, nothing for the nuclear. And year eight, the first nuclear unit of these three finally come online. So we've got one gigawatt of nuclear and 28 gigawatts of, of solar power. And this is what I mean, nuclear, global warming is not going to be taking a vacation for these eight years. Carbon dioxide is going up and up and up, whereas the photovoltaics begin to stop it immediately. Year nine, the second nuclear unit comes online and photovoltaics, so you've got two gigawatts of nuclear and 36 gigawatts of, of solar. And finally, I've run this out for 10 years, and you've got 45 gigawatts of solar and three gigawatts of nuclear. It really talks to this issue of how much um, lead time is built into these calculations. So in the States, when we hear somebody in Congress say, well, in, in 2030, we're going to have the first small modular reactor, that's 15 years from now. Do we really think that global warming is going to sit around and wait for this first small modular reactor if, in fact, it ever was affordable? So now there's one other piece of the puzzle, and that's money. There's this thing called the levelized cost of, uh, of operating a, a, a power plant. And it's basically, basically what it would charge once it was built into the, um, into the grid. So we, we also call it bus bar energy. And it includes three things, um, the, the capital cost. And of course, nuclear power plants have a very high capital cost. But you'll hear them saying that, oh my gosh, once we get it built, the fuel is free or pretty darn cheap. Well, the last time I checked, solar was free, wasn't it? So solar is cheaper and the fuel is free also. And then the last piece is the cost to operate. A nuclear power plant requires about 700 people. The average salary is about $100,000. So the staff at a nuclear power plant is very, very high. So the cost to send that power out to the grid is, is what this slide, this slide represents. Assuming you, could, you spent all that money and assuming you weighed it for the, um, the, you know, for the 10 years for that nuclear power plant to be built, let's compare the cost of solar versus the cost of, a, of a, a, a nuclear power plant. So the green bars represent um, uh, contracted costs. These are already committed dollars by, I don't know, almost a dozen different solar power plants that have been built. And um, on the left is 213, on the right is 216. And you can see that the contracted price, prices that entrepreneurs are willing to sell you solar electricity at, have dropped from about seven cents down to about three cents a kilowatt. Now the, the other numbers at the top are four nuclear power plants that are uh, being considered to be built, one of which is under construction right now, that's Vogel. But um, North Anna, Turkey Point, and Hinkley Point are all proposed to be built. And you can see they're all at 13 to 18 cents a kilowatt. So the question is, why, even if I had $8 trillion to build 1,000 nukes to offset 6% of the carbon dioxide, why would I do that? 
that doesn't make economic sense. The last line on this, this curve, the, 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 green, the blue line that cuts through the green, there's a cost to conserve. It's called a negawatt, negative watt. The, if you're going to insulate your windows or change your light bulbs, um, the cost to conserve is around three cents. And you can see now solar, building new solar is actually right around, if not slightly less than, the cost to conserve energy, which I think is an incredible number. It's actually cheaper to produce solar power than it is to conserve energy based on, again, this, this comes from Citibank. They're not exactly an anti-nuclear outfit either. They have no dog in the fight. They're, they're, they're an investment banker. So uh, this is from the, the same Citibank report. Um, they, they talk about what's, what has to happen in order for solar and renewables to be effective on the grid is that uh, we will have distributed generation. And by that, what, what we, the, the paradigm I grew up in when I was building nuclear power plants was that we had large central station power plants, um, 400 of them around the world in, in nuclear plus coal and all the others. That concept is a 20th century construct. The 21st century doesn't have to be like the 20th century. And a matter of fact, it shouldn't be. What we've got now is a distributed grid. We're moving toward a distributed grid with many, many small producers of, of power. So anyway, Citibank says utilities, the traditional people that own these central station power plants can be winners, but they have to transform with the times. And then they talk about renewables, solar, wind, et cetera, despite intermittency. And what that means is we all know the sun doesn't shine all the time. But there will be systems built into the grid to, um, to accommodate the, the highs and the lows of solar and wind production. Um, despite the intermittencies, renewables could operate as smoothly as traditional fossil energy. It's the Citibank saying that. So when you have your nuclear people say, we need baseball, baseload power, um, it's like you can't play uh, hardball with the big boys unless you're in the nuclear league. That's really not true. As a matter of fact, thousands of small distributors make a grid that's more reliable than a few big power plants. Citibank. The, um, uh, the other thing that I suggested at the beginning of this presentation is that having grown up building nuclear power plants, it was never about CO2. CO2 is a marketing ploy. To, to mask the fact that somebody wants to make $8 trillion building power plants to solve 6% of the world's problems. So um, I wanted to share this with you. I was quoted, I gave a speech uh, a little over a year ago. We all know that the wind doesn't blow consistently and the sun doesn't shine every day. But the nuclear industry would have you believe that humankind is smart enough to develop techniques to store nuclear waste for a quarter of a million years but at the same time, humankind is so dumb, we can't figure out how to store solar electricity overnight. So that's really the bottom line. Do we really want to store toxic nuclear waste? Do we really want to desecrate Native American and First Nation uh, um, uh, reservations to, to draw uranium out of the soil? Or do we want to develop a grid that's distributed? And I submit to you, not only is that um, um, uh, interesting and, and, and morally appropriate, but it's economically appropriate too. Building new nukes doesn't make economic sense. There's a thing in, in, um, in economics that's called um, the um, opportunity cost. And what that means is if I commit $8 trillion to building nuclear power plants, that's $8 trillion I can't spend on solar or wind. So if you tie up eight trillion on nuclear power, you're actually making the problem worse because the alternatives can come online faster and cheaper than nuclear power ever could. All right, thank you very much. And uh, I'll take questions later.